Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We will be getting started in just a few minutes. We'll give um, everybody a little bit more time to get connected and get their audio going, and then we'll kick things off. Hi everyone, I see a few additional folks joining in. We're gonna give it just a few more minutes before we get started. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Hi everyone, good afternoon. I see a few more joining in, so we're just gonna continue to wait just a few more minutes and then we will get started. We've got a great um, great webinar planned and really excited to be able to um, share more with you all. I have some great guests with us today. All right. Um, well, for the sake of time, we will go ahead and kick things off. Um, we may have a few more joining us as we get started. But again, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to our second webinar in honor of Newborn Screening Awareness Month. And I am so excited to be facilitating this discussion today. Um, we have three incredible families joining us. And I can tell you that I've had the privilege, and I truly mean privilege to work with these three families and many more who aren't on this panel today um, over the last 10 months to really learn more from their lived real experiences. And we are just privileged and honored today to have them joining us to share with all of you as well um, a little bit more about their personal experiences with newborn screening and also um, their experiences as a part of our newborn screening, our Navigate Newborn Screening Ambassador Program. Um, and so I'm going to give each of them some time and just a little bit to share more about each of them individually, but I'd like to just welcome and thank uh, Ms. Lisa Brackbill, Ms. Liz Carter, and Ms. Tara Tanella, Tanella excuse me, um, for joining us today and for sharing with us. A couple of quick housekeeping things before we jump in. This webinar will be recorded and shared after today through our YouTube channel and our website. Um, we will have time for questions uh, for our guests today and for our families. Um, so if you do have them, please feel free at any time to put them into the chat box. We will be monitoring the chat box. Um, you are welcome to engage and ask there and talk with one another as we're going through the webinar. However, we will hold time for questions until the very end. So feel free to drop them at any point, but we'll come back to those at the end of the webinar. So with that, I'd also first like to very much thank um, our partners at HRSA who have graciously funded the work that you will be hearing a little bit more about through the Newborn Screening Family Education Program. Um, through this program, we have been able to develop and create our Navigate Newborn Screening Ambassador Program, which, which these three wonderful women have been a part of, again, as I said, over the last 10 months. So a quick agenda of what we hope to cover today. Um, really, this is true for most of the webinars that we share. We really want to aim to first build some knowledge um, for those of you who are listening in. And then we want to take some time to really reflect specifically on the experiences that you'll hear more about. And I think what's so incredible and so unique about the three guests that are sharing with us today is that you will see each of their experiences with the newborn screening system is quite different. Um, and that's been really true to the work that we've done through this program and through the work of Expecting Health is really to bring to the table and bring to light the different lived experiences that families experience and have. It's through those experiences that we're able to build our knowledge, become more educated, and really raise our awareness of um, what's working and what's maybe not working so well in the newborn screening system. So we hope to take some time through a casual conversation to really reflect and learn from um, each of these individual families' lived experiences. 
And then last but certainly not least, we want to leave you with some specific actions that each of you can think about taking individually in your own communities and even at the national level. Um, because again, we want to learn from these experiences and we want, we want to put these experiences into a forward motion. So first, we wanted to share just a bit more briefly about the Navigate Newborn Screening Ambassador Program and just start to share a little bit more. This was a new program that launched through Expecting Health and again through the Newborn Screening Family Education Program in October of last year, in October of 2021. And at that time, we recruited our first class or first group of individual ambassadors. And really, this is a network, a growing network of family leaders that represent very different, very diverse perspectives. And I mean that in really every aspect aspect of that word from different representations of conditions that their families, um, children or individuals in their families have been diagnosed with, different geographic locations. Um, we've had male and female perspectives included in this group. We have rural and urban perspectives included in this group. We have different races and ethnicities included in this group. And it's really been a goal to bring you know a very diverse group of individuals to this program and as we continue to grow this program moving forward that continues to be a priority through this program individuals that have participated really participate um, over a period of time in varied online and live learning experiences so we have different curriculums that each of the ambassadors complete online quarterly, and we also had a live training session that happened um, in February of last year. And through these online and live training experiences, we learned and taught on different topics like connecting with others, sharing your story, understanding and learning from the available newborn screening resources, with the end goal of really building this collaborative network of families that are connected to one another and connected to the newborn screening system so that each of these individuals could continue to lead within that system. We had a variety of discussion groups and activities that took place throughout the year. And what you're seeing here in this, in this screen and in the map is where each of our 10 ambassadors um, are located. And you can also see again that there really is quite a diverse perspective of different conditions um, and locations represented in this group. So we're very fortunate to have each of these individuals, some who are joining us today um, by listening in. Hello to all of you that are there in the audience um, and those that are here to share their stories today. So we often get asked the question, that's great you have this program, but what do they actually do? <laughs> and what, uh, what were your goals of this program? And really it's simple. Our goal was to build this network of family leaders in the newborn screening system that connect, that build, and that lead. And so what do we mean by that? Well, first and foremost, one of our main goals was to identify family leaders who not only had the opportunity to connect with one another and to expand their awareness and knowledge of conditions within the newborn screening system, but also to connect these individual leaders to other opportunities within the newborn screening system. And in order to do that, we helped build knowledge and awareness. So that's where the training sort of took place and came in. Um, so we talked through a variety of relative uh, top relevant topics um, and really aim to uh, grow and build leadership skills for the ambassadors that were participating in this program. So that by the end of the program, um, there are, they are more confident, more aware, and more familiar with opportunities to lead within the newborn screening system. So one of the ways that we measured um, our success of this first year's program was to really ask some specific questions related to knowledge and confidence. And so at the beginning of the program, we asked each of the ambassadors to share with us how they felt about their knowledge around newborn screening. And what you can see on the left-hand side of this pie is that it was actually surprising to us that over half of the individuals that had elected to participate in this program felt like they didn't know as much about newborn screening. They felt like they were just starting to learn or knew a little bit about newborn screening. But by the end and by completing this program and all of the trainings associated with it, over 50% moved into that. I feel like I know a lot about newborn screening category. So we were super excited to see that through the interactions with one another, through the ability to share their stories and experiences with one another, and through the trainings that were provided, we were able, even in a very experienced group of family leaders, to increase their knowledge around the newborn screening system as a whole. 
The other thing we asked about was confidence in very specific areas. So we asked our ambassadors to share at the beginning, at the end of the program, how confident they felt in these categories. So one, serving as a leader, two, in their ability to talk to other families about newborn screening, three, to talk to their healthcare providers about newborn screening, and four, how confident that they feel in their ability to find information about newborn screening. And you can see from these bar graphs here that across the board and all four categories, our ambassadors grew in their confidence in those areas. So even though we started out with a confident group of family leaders, and these were families that already had some knowledge of newborn screening, again, through the community that you will certainly hear about and through learning from one another and learning through connecting to others um, and having the opportunity to share their story, uh, confidence and leadership continued to grow. So we were really excited by, uh, by the impacts that we are starting to see through this program. Um, so with that, I am super excited. I'm going to stop sharing my screen because we want this to feel comfortable and casual. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I am going to transition and give each of our ambassadors a few minutes uh, to share a little bit more about themselves and introduce themselves and their experiences um, with newborn screening as an introduction. So I am going to start with Tara. And Tara, if you don't mind going first, we'd love to hear a little bit more from you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mariana. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Tara Tanella. Um, I live in Massapequa, New York with my family, which includes my husband, Joe, and our three children. Um, we have Joey, who's 11, Victoria, who's eight, and Adriana, who's one. Um, our newborn screening story is a successful one and really followed the standard newborn screening protocols. Our newborn screening journey begins 11 years ago with the birth of our son. Uh, he entered the world February 8th, 2011, and appeared as a normal newborn baby. Uh, my husband and I were first-time parents, really just enjoying the overwhelming experiences that come along with that, um, as well as me kind of laboring through the challenges of afterbirth. So once we were released from the hospital, headed home, and we welcomed Joey into our new home, and it really was a perfect moment. Unfortunately, that kind of was short-lived. Um, within 24 hours of being home on day three of Joey's life, we received a life-changing phone call um, from, our, from a pediatric genetics doctor at Stony Brook Medical Center. And she explained slowly that my son had tested, po had tested positive for the rare metabolic disease, galactosemia, and that we needed to urgently take him to the hospital uh, while informing me to stop breastfeeding and formula feeding my son. I'd never heard of galactosemia, nor did I recall my son being tested for the newborn screening test in the hospital. I had a long 72 hour labor. Um, so it's not something that I was paying attention to in the hospital. Um, our baby boy tested positive for the very rare metabolic disorder galactosemia that untreated would lead to death. Um, for the past three days, I had been poisoning my newborn son with my breast milk and formula. Uh, his body was slowly shutting down. Um, sorry. <laughs> You know, we arrived at the hospital and they immediately retested him um, to ensure that those tests were, were in fact positive. So as we sat in the neonatal intensive care unit, as you can imagine, our minds channeled all the what ifs. He was lethargic, wasn't eating. He slept most of the day. His liver was swollen. He was jaundiced. His labs were off the charts. Um, the doctors, you know, with that galactosemia confirmation started to begin treatment, um, and that treatment con consisted of Billy lights. He received multiple vitamin K shots, numerous blood tra plasma transfusions um, to decrease his labs. And as the days passed, that treatment was starting to work, right? And he really responded to a soy-based diet. And um, we uh, saw that slow progression, and he was released to come home on Valentine's Day. Um, without that newborn screening positive test results, we would potentially be on a different journey today. Um, for the birth of my two daughters, who are Joey's younger siblings, we worked with our state and our metabolic clinic to flag an alert on their newborn screening test so that we could track those results closely and quickly. Um, my daughters both started out on soy formula so that in the event they did receive positive results, they wouldn't be consuming dairy, um, which is life-threatening to galactosemics. Galactosemics cannot metabolize the sugar galactose, which is primarily found in dairy. 
Um, fortunately, both my girls tested negative for the disorder. Joey's a miracle. He's my why, why I'm passionate about advocating for newborn screening and being part of this new Navigate Newborn Screening Ambassador Program. Um, the program has really helped me find my voice and raise awareness about the newborn screening system. My favorite part of the program is really connecting with other families, the other ambassadors, really while helping educate others as well. Um, the ambassador program has really given me a sense of community, one that I never dreamed of being a part, um, but one that has really helped me find my purpose. Um, so for that, I am forever grateful for newborn screening. It is the test that did save my son's life. Thank you so much, Tara. Um, Liz, I think we're gonna have you go next. Yeah. Hey everybody, I'm Liz Carter. I live in uh, Lexington, South Carolina, right outside of the capital of Columbia. Um, my connection to newborn screening really began with the birth of my second son. Um, of course, our first son underwent newborn screening too, but I didn't think anything of it. Um, my second son was born in 2016 and um, I sort of kind of remember a fuzzy oh yeah by the way your baby passed the newborn screen so we were like okay great and we took him home and life with two children began and our family was complete um it would be two and a half years later so when elliot was two and a half um he got sick and we thought he just had a normal virus and just day by day elliot just got worse uh, he was not improving so we took him in to be assessed and to kind of figure out what was going on. And um, we, doctors discovered that Elliot had clotting throughout the brain and told us, you know, we may lose him to this. We may never know why, um, but we're gonna do everything we can. So at that point, um, we were just, you know, doctors were grasping at straws, had no idea what was going on, what could cause the clotting. Um, it, it's funny, not funny, but funny. After the fact, I read through some of Elliot's medical records and uh, for the time he was in the hospital and doctors were trying to figure out what was going on. And um, time and time again in the notes, the doctor's notes, it would say, could this be a metabolic related issue? And then it would quickly be dismissed. No, his newborn screen was, was negative. And so seeing that was kind of like, oh, you had the answer right there in your grasp, you know, and I know doctors were doing everything they could uh, for us. So I, you know, I certainly don't blame them, but, but yeah, looking back now, it's, it's pretty crazy to read and see something like that. So um, we were very lucky though, about two weeks into our hospital stay, doctors uh, through a blood test determined that Elliot's homocysteine level was extremely high and um, pretty much concluded from there that he likely had homocysteinuria. And um, they told us, don't Google it, do not Google it, just know that it can be treated. And I went, oh, thank God, a condition that can be treated. So that's what we did. Starting right then and there in the hospital, we um, started a low protein diet uh, because with homocysteinuria, um, a body can't break down methionine, an essential amino acid that we get through food. So started the low protein diet, the medical formula and the vitamin regimen. And we saw Elliot essentially come back to life before our eyes. And it was a miracle. Um, Elliot is doing a, amazingly today. He is in first grade, he's six years old. He plays flag football, he plays basketball. I can't keep up with him. He's always moving, always going, always busy, wants to be just like his big brother. Um, it makes me laugh every day, just, it, it was miraculous. So something that was so traumatic for our family has really turned into something so beautiful for our family because, uh, I've just been connected with so many others, the, the other two ladies, um, Tara and Lisa on this call, and then there are some listening in and all of the other ambassador families. Um, that has been something that this program, the, I think the biggest benefit for me, because our newborn screening story is a little different. It, you know, it, there's a lot of trauma, like I said. And so connecting with other families and other mothers who completely understand, um, has been very, it's been part of the healing process for me. So we'll talk more about that, I'm sure. Um, but the biggest 
benefit from this program for me has been connecting with others um, who have really become my friends and a support system for me. So thank you. Thanks, Liz. I feel like I hear, you know, I've had the opportunity to hear several of these stories multiple times. And every time I hear it, I learn again, something new and I've just moved in it in a different way. So thank you both so far for sharing. Um, certainly not le last, last but not least, I should say, Lisa, if you don't mind sharing a little bit. Good afternoon. Um, it is truly an honor to be here today to share a small part of my story and to tell you how I became part of changing the newborn screening system here in Pennsylvania. But first, I want to introduce you to my daughter, Victoria, because without her, it's possible that none of these changes would have happened. Tori was born on July 30th, 2014. She was healthy, alert, beautiful. She brought so much joy to our lives. I remember remarking to my husband about two weeks after she was born that everything from that test, and that's exactly what I said, but I'm at newborn screening. I just didn't know. Uh, it must have been okay because we never heard anything. But unfortunately, that's not our story. This picture was taken the day before Tori became symptomatic, and we had no idea that our lives were completely about to change. The next day, it was like a switch had flipped. She became a completely different baby. She was very clearly in pain. She stopped smiling, talking. She couldn't keep any food down. The list goes on. It was, it was traumatic, honestly. Um, it took six weeks and two missed diagnoses to get a final diagnosis, but really it was only two weeks from the time she had a CAT scan and they said the phrase brain abnormalities to the diagnosis of Crabbe disease, thanks to Hershey Medical Center's expertise with Crabbe. On Friday, February the 13th, of course, Friday the 13th, she was diagnosed officially with Crabbe disease, which is a form of leukodystrophy. That day, we found out that our six-month-old daughter was dying. Dying is not a word that should describe anyone's six-month-old child. Even worse, that day we found out that if they had screened for Crab A at birth, they could have treated it. And I'm honestly not sure which part of those messages was more devastating. Um, Tori passed away 14 months later on Easter Sunday, 2016. But while she was here for those short 20 months, we did 50 bucket list adventures and we lived life to the fullest. We have thousands of pictures, so many memories, um, and we, that's, that was our goal while she was here. 10 days before Tori died, my advocacy for newborn screening officially began on Rare Disease Day at the Pennsylvania Capitol. She was with me and she helped me lobby a little bit. Three weeks after Tori died, I attended my first newborn screening advisory board meeting, and I've only missed one meeting since, and that's because I had just given birth to twins. <laughs> I had a valid excuse. Um, I went because I wanted to see Crabbe added to the newborn screening panel here in Pennsylvania. But by attending those meetings and listening, I began to realize that there were bigger problems to be solved here and that maybe I was the one that was supposed to help solve them. Um, this fix would require a legislative overhaul of the entire system. So while I would do anything to have my daughter here today as a healthy eight-year-old girl, I know that this was always supposed to be my story. For most of my life, I had fully planned to enter politics and be a lobbyist. I even have a political science degree, but all of that changed when I actually did it as a job. And I actually left that job and in politics entirely. But then my daughter was diagnosed with a treatable condition and I re-entered the arena as a mother. So a year after I began attending those meetings, we introduced our first piece of legislation, which I would find out later died due to failed um, partisan politics. We tried again, and it again failed due to partisan politics. The second bill that died was actually numbered after Tori's birthday, so that loss stung a little bit more for me. But in September of 2019, I had a meeting that changed everything. Somebody behind the scenes who worked for the Speaker of the House, I happened to run into him, happened to, he happened to overhear my story, and he decided that this is something he wanted to do. So he guided me behind the scenes, and in January of 2020, we introduced SB 983 in Pennsylvania, and then COVID, and I was not about to fail a third time. So while we waited to see what would happen, we held virtual stakeholder meetings, we worked out details of how it would be funded and things like that, but we were running out of time. It finally went into committee on September 21st of 2020 and was signed two months later on November 25th. I am still exhausted, <laughs> but Act 133, 
made screening equal from hospital to hospital in Pennsylvania. It aligned Pennsylvania with the federal RUSP. It gave authority to the advisory board to add conditions, but most importantly, it made screening for CREBE mandatory in Pennsylvania. Since that law went into effect, four babies with CREBE disease have been identified and have received life-saving treatment. Four. For a rare disease, that is, it's unbelievable. It's very bittersweet for us, of course, because we would we wish nobody would have CREBE disease. Um, after Act 133 went into effect, I was ready to retire from all of this because I do have twins that take up a lot of energy. But I was told by several people I still have work to do, and they were right. So this year I guided a group of um, congenital, congenital cytomegalovirus mamas to victory in Pennsylvania. Um, their bill was signed a couple of months ago. So now moms will be expecting mothers will be educated about CMV during pregnancy. And if their child fails their hearing screen, they will have the opportunity to screen for CMV because that is also treatable. I have also helped educate and equip other moms and leukodystrophy families through the Leukodystrophy Newborn Screening Action Network. And a little over a year ago, I became an ambassador with Expecting Health, which has been a wonderful experience for so many reasons that we will elaborate later. But it truly is all because of this girl and our great loss that I advocate. Crabbe stole so much from her. It stole her smile, her voice, her eyes, her life. And now I will continue to work so that other parents can take advantage of gene therapy and other clinical trials for Crabbe that are happening right here. Uh, because those babies deserve a chance at life that our Tori didn't receive. No parent should have to bury their child, especially when newborn screening could have given them the opportunity to treat the condition, and that's why I advocate. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, just take a minute to catch my own breath after that and after all that's been shared. Um, I think I mentioned it earlier, and I think it's pretty evident um, what incredible ladies the three of you are. Um, one, for just being open and sharing your experiences here today, but two, for the work and the passion that you've brought to the newborn screening community. And it's that passion um, in different ways. And that's what I love about each of your stories is that they are so different, um, but in different ways, it's led you all here um, together. And I think that's been a really amazing part of the ambassador experience. Um, so with that, uh, you know, we talk a lot and I'm going to kind of transition into some conversation now, but as you three know, and we'll share with others, we talked a lot in the program about defining family leadership or thinking about what family leadership means. And that's such a broad term um, for, in, for us individually, but also to think about family leadership and the newborn screening community and in the system. So I'd love to hear from you all. Um, why do you think it's important to have family leaders in the newborn screening system? Kind of what does that mean to you? Um, and feel free, anyone to jump in and go first. I'll kick it off. <laughs> um, so I think it's most important and we kind of just witnessed it, right? Everyone's experience is so different or yet the same. So to have families truly affected by newborn screening or, or not even directly, right? We have folks as part of the ambassador program that aren't directly, maybe indirectly um, impacted by newborn screening. Everyone's perspective um, is different and what you can bring to that, ex you know, sharing your experience and what you can bring to help others um, is something that we may not know is even needed, but as you have those discussions, it's important to look at others to get their feedback and input. So I think it's important to have all perspectives um, and just that sharing of experiences is really important. To build off of that, I would say it's so important to have the family voice in any of these discussions because I was even in a recent meeting where it was a bunch of stakeholders talking about the newborn screening system and they said things that I was like, you clearly haven't lived this, but with, and if we didn't tell our stories, they wouldn't know. And so I love that there are so many other people, part of the ambassador program and, and maybe who will be future ambassadors who want to be that voice so that they understand the true impact. Absolutely. Liz, anything you wanna to add to that? I couldn't have said it better. Um, just that, yeah, the stories are, really what connects us. And we're all impacted in some way 
by newborn screening. You know, I mean, I think all of us, when we shared our story said, oh, we kind of remember hearing something in the hospital, oh, your baby passed the screening test or, or whatever the news was. Um, and you just don't think about it. It doesn't really hit home, you know, with you until you are somehow, you know, greatly impacted. Um, but yeah, just the telling of our stories, I think is, is what really makes us leaders. Awesome. Um, so another question for you, and you each kind of, I think, touched on this a little bit as you shared your introductions, um, and there's probably more than one answer to this question, but how do you feel that this program in particular um, has, has really helped you grow personally? Um, you've done a lot before getting into this program and being part, a part of this program, but if you can kind of think back over the last year, um, you know, what are some of the specific things that each of you has seen as an area of growth for yourself? I don't mind going first this one. So even though I did have a lot of experience in the new grant, newborn screening system, it's all been on the advisory board and, you know, the legislative side. And I honestly have struggled in the other areas with feeling like I had a place at the table, which I know probably sounds ridiculous, but it can be really hard to break into the advocacy space, especially when there are people and organizations that have been doing this forever. And so I have really struggled with what, where is my place? Like, where do I fit in? Do I even fit in here? And so being part of this ambassador journey has been good for so many reasons. But one of those things was that it showed me that we're all just figuring it out. I, it's easy to look at somebody and be like, oh, they have it all figured out. Like, look, they're so confident. And really, we all are coming from the same vulnerable place where we want to be part of this. We just may not know how. And so it has given me so much more confidence to just do what I feel called to do, which is to share Tori's story and save lives. And it does, I don't have to have it figured out. So that's one of the ways that, that I've definitely grown. Yeah, to piggyback off of that, um, I was going to say something similar along the lines of, you know, I kind of live my life in galactosemia world, right, with um, our own individual community and being a part of this program, that small piece where I was kind of living in my own bubble and advocacy, hearing everyone's stories and experiences and, and bringing that back to my own self and, and how I can make change specifically for galactosemia, but but larger than that, and, and just in general, just regarding newborn screening and rare disease, I think it's given me the confidence to say, sharing my story, even if it only impacts one person, then I've made a difference. So just being able through the program to kind of have those story sharing sessions, hearing where we can share our stories, how we can share them, how to um, navigate your story differently for different audiences, learning that and then applying it um, has really been impactful for me out of the program. I'm gonna piggyback. <laughs> so, I mean, I think, you know, the <laughs> biggest thing that this, this organization, or this um, program has done for me, well, a lot of things, but um, I think I've just grown most in learning how to channel my story. I've always been willing to tell my story and I will tell it to anybody who will listen any time of day because I know that that's a, an important part of, you know, propelling change forward. Um, but uh, just learning kind of how to tell that story in what avenues, in what places and with whom. Um, and I've been able to learn that in great part from the other advocates, um, like Tara just participated in, I always say the acronyms because I don't want to mess up the full blown words, but she just participated in a huge PSDD meeting with the FDA. And I wanted to learn, you know, how do you do that? How do you go about that? Like what, what, you know, do you have to, how do you tell your story to an audience like that? Lisa's done, I, I can't even begin to name all the things that Lisa's done and I've learned a lot from her. So I think that's the biggest way that I've grown is just kind of, learning from others and kind of figuring out, you know, and really just learning from their experiences. Yeah, that's, that's so awesome to hear. And like, even just hearing you guys reflect and thinking of the conversations that I've listened in on and been a part of, I've heard from, from many of our ambassadors, you know, kind of knowing where to start is sometimes the hardest part. Um, and that could mean a lot of different things, but I think through this connecting with others and listening and 
sort of being able to hear, well, this is something I was thinking about and a challenge I had, and it may not have anything to do with the same challenge that someone else has experienced, but at least how they thought about it and how they approached it sort of made light bulbs go off for other people. And so I heard over and over from all of our ambassadors that I felt super confident coming into this program about my condition area or about my family, but this has really opened my eyes to all of the different components of the newborn screening as a system. And that's truly our goal from a program perspective is we want to help families be a part of the system. The system needs families to be a part of it. So what does that mean? What does that look like? And how can we um, help build a community of family leaders that feel confident to be involved? And you guys are an amazing example of what that looks like. Um, and there are many others as well uh, who would be more than happy to share their stories also. Um, so let me ask you this, and again, these kind of build on each other, but um, you sort of has, have touched on this, but when we think about how this you know, this experience and experiences outside of this program as well. It certainly doesn't have to be limited to the ambassador program, but kind of where you are now and what you've learned up to this point, how have you seen that come to life and how you've helped others? So like, how have you been able through this program or otherwise to help other families? Maybe share some specific examples um, that you guys can think of. I, I'll start this time. Um, I... I always felt like I was the one being helped, I guess, or for a long time, that's how I felt. Um, but I guess, you know, just being there for other parents who will be affected by newborn screening, just to give you an example, um, about a year ago, I met another mom, she lives in Canada, and her son was diagnosed at eight years old with homocystinuria. So the same disorder that my son has. And, um, she just didn't know where to begin. She didn't, I, she, her whole world as she knew it had changed. And, you know, all I could say was, you know, Hey, I'm Liz and I know what you're going through. I've been there. And I, I don't know what that did for her other than letting her know that she wasn't alone, but, um, she started now a year out. Her son was diagnosed, like I said, a little over a year ago, she's like, you know what, I'm ready to get into thinking about newborn screening. And, I'm asking questions about his newborn screening test. And she, I, I see her now starting to, like I said, ask questions and try to get more engaged and to learn more about the system where she lives. So um, yeah, for what it's worth, I've been able just to speak to my experiences and kind of guide her along and just knowing, like giving her what questions to ask. Because in the beginning, I didn't even know what questions I had. So yeah. Yeah, I think for me, um, I kind of came into the program not knowing a lot about the newborn screening system other than just my experience with newborn screening tests. Um, and as I learned more about the system and hearing the experiences of the other ambassadors, I think the hearing test was one that I directly was impacted by, you know, more recently. Um, where I was fortunate to learn from from one of our ambassadors more about the hearing pro, um, the hearing screening and and kind of how to follow up and where to find information resources. Um, and I actually was able to help a couple of families recently um, with failed hearing tests and I felt so confident. I was like, I know where you can go. And I was able to really implement using the resources that I learned um, were available. Um, so that was one really kind of impactful where I was actually able to educate somebody by giving them resources that they could actually use. Um, and I think holistically for me, right, for, for the metabolic diseases, right, these are life-threatening conditions um, that at birth, if they're not treated, you know, within a certain period of time, they can be fatal. Um, so just that education piece, bringing it back to specifically my community and then learning about other metabolic disorders really in that space. Um, I'm starting to think about how do we get those results within the states that don't have quick turnaround times. I was fortunate in New York, we had a three day turnaround time, which is rare. <laughs> um, I, so, so I hear. Um, so to have a three day turnaround on a metabolic condition is key. Um, so really starting to implement those discussions on lab timelines on getting results to families um, has been a really big focal area. Uh, the most recent experience that I had with connecting with another family was um, we almost had a fifth 
well, we thought we might have a fifth crabe case in Pennsylvania. And the dad reached out on social media to other crabe families who directed them him to me because he's here in Pennsylvania. Thankfully, he found out this morning his child does not have crebe, but I was able to walk him through like, this is what they're going to do. This is what the newborn screening meant. And so I was so grateful that I have the knowledge and even more grateful he didn't need it. Um, but I was able to, he, he actually thanked me for giving him hope. Um, so I'm just, I'm grateful for that. That's the only, that's the only thing I would add to what they said. <laughs> hope is always key. Um, so for the sake of time, I'm going to ask one more question before we um, kind of move into answering. I see some questions coming in through the chat as well, which is great. Um, and I know this is this, I say one question, this is probably a big question. So take a minute to, to answer it. But I think um, it would be super helpful to hear from you all as experienced families and leaders within the newborn screening system. You know, if what, what do you wish newborn screening stakeholders and decision makers in newborn screening know about this program or kind of what are the things that you really wish you had the opportunity and you really wish that they could know something um, from your perspective, what would, what would that be? What would you share with them? Well, that is a huge question. There's a <laughs> lot there. Um, but, um, I, we talk a lot amongst ourselves as, as an ambassador group, and we, we've just been, you know, through our conversations grappling with why is, why is change so difficult? Um, we're grateful for this system because we know that it saves lives, right? But we've talked a lot about, like, where's the hang up? Like, uh, the changes that we, you know, can see that, you know, we would suggest, you know, needing to be changed, um, why, why is that so difficult? And the one thing we just kind of kept coming back to is every state is so different, right? With newborn screening. And so I would love to change the name of the recommended uniform screening panel to the required uniform screening panel and, and have every state screen for every condition on the panel all the time so that all babies are identified in every state, no matter where the baby is. Um, and yeah, just, just kind of creating a more uniform system because I think part of the difficulty in navigating is that it is so different state to state. Um, so if I had to pick one, I think main thing, it would be that just kind of a more uniform system um, and every disorder that's on the RUSP be screened for in every state. So I think for me, um, there, there's a lot, it's a big question, but if I could kind of focus on one area, um, for me, it's all about educating. A program like this has people available to hit the right people and the right channels to get information about newborn screening out. Personally, I knew nothing about newborn screening. First time mom, never heard of the test. Um, I didn't allude to it in my story when I was sharing, but that phone call that I received was from a, um, a doctor that had a language barrier. And I really didn't even understand what she was really saying when she did communicate the results to me. And I actually did hang up the phone and said that I wasn't interested in the test. That was my initial first response when she said, what I heard was something about a test. That's all I heard the word test. And I just got home from the hospital and I said, I wasn't interested in taking the test. Um, immediately she called back and I had said, if I didn't pick up that phone call, what would you guys have done? And they said, we were going to send police escorts to your house to get your baby, to bring him to the hospital. That was the protocol that New York had in place for a child that tested positive. Um, thankfully, I'm thankful that that would have happened, but for me, how do we change as like using a program like this? How do we get that information into the right hand so that people are educated across all, everyone? So equality in information, um, how do we get to pediatricians, gynecologists, sh shelters, anywhere, anywhere that you know folks can receive that information? It needs to be available for folks to be aware. If you're not aware, then you won't be impacted. You, you're not gonna, well, you don't know, you don't know, right? <laughs> so if we can uh, use a program like this to implement that change at the source before anything even happens, um, I think that will really make a change, a big difference. 
I love what both of you said. That's absolutely what I would have said because if Tori had been born three hours north in New York, she would have been screened and our story would be different. Zip code shouldn't matter. Education is so important because there's so much misunderstanding and misinformation about all this. The other thing that I would add is that they need to realize that we are the ones who are willing, ready, and honestly, sometimes the only ones who can go and make this effort. Like when I talk about Act 133 and say it was me, it really was because the Department of Health couldn't do it. They're not allowed to. Um, the an advisory board couldn't. They weren't allowed to, to fight for these changes. So it fell on me. Because we are independent, we are parents, we are passionate. We need to be part of the conversation. We are the ones who are going to drive these changes. So we, they need to have more faith in us. Um, I remember when I first started attending the advisory board meetings, I would bring up new research that was going on because I was always putting Crebe on the agenda. I'm like, you need to talk about this. But they would disregard what I was saying because I'm not a doctor. So then, of course, when papers would be published proving what I said, I would pass that along too. And I understand that they want to rely on expertise, but at the same time, we are the ones who live and breathe this. And so they need to understand that we matter and that sometimes we are the perfect people for the job. Yeah, all very profound, I think, insight and, and thoughts to share and, and truly to be a collaborative system. It takes all experience and all expertise. And I think it, it definitely, you know, we talk a lot as a group about the importance of recognizing the expertise across the board that everyone brings with families being a part of that and central to that. Um, not just kind of the people receiving or experiencing screening on the back end. Um, and we talked a lot about as well about newborn screening as more than just a screen at birth or just a test at birth. For all of you, it's, it's every day. It's every single day of your life. Um, and so what does that, you know, just keeping that in the forefront as we talk about newborn screening, as we talk about very important, very positive changes in newborn screening, but just remembering that it isn't just a screen at birth. It's truly a system that's evolving and changing over time. And that the only way we can move that forward in a positive direction is ensuring that your experiences are teaching us along the way. Um, so I know we're coming up on time and I do want to leave a little bit of time for questions from the audience as well. So I am going to share my screen again. We said earlier that we were going to um, leave you all with some actions as well. And that's extremely important um, to us. So I wanted to just share with you a few next steps and resources um, as you kind of processed and taken away what has been shared and what you've heard from these. Again, amazing. Thank you again, Liz, Lisa, and Tara for sharing um, so much in your experiences that we can learn. So just to kind of bring us home and, and emphasize, you know, again, we talk a lot within this program, but in newborn screening as a whole, why do we share our stories? Why is sharing family stories so important? And there are many, many, many reasons. But what we really want to focus on is that it's through these stories and through the experiences that we educate ourselves, we educate each other, we educate the system and the system grows. And so what I wanted each of you to be aware of and to know is that we've actually created a book of each of our ambassadors who have kindly and graciously shared their story. Um, you can scan this QR code and access this book. You are welcome to share this book with others in your networks. Um, if you are a family listening in, if you are a healthcare provider listening in, if you are a part of an advocacy organization listening in, this is something that is available and can be shared. And it's through this book and through the story shared in this book um, that we can continue to raise our knowledge and awareness of the impact specifically that newborn screening have on families. Um, I definitely recommend taking some time to read through it. There's a lot of really amazing um, stories in here. The other thing I wanted to share and preview um, through our newborn screening uh, ambassador program or Navigate Newborn Screening Ambassador Program, we had the Exciting opportunity, as you've heard through these stories and through what these ladies have shared. I think the community within this group has been beyond any expectation any of us had at the beginning of this program. And we were fortunate enough to bring together uh, not everybody, we really wanted everybody to be able to join, but a subgroup of our ambassadors over the summer 
to record in a video form their individual stories as well as discussions very similar to this, um, highlighting the importance of community amongst families and amongst others within the newborn screening system, really talking about as family leaders, you know, what changes do you hope to see within the newborn screening system and what does that look like? And we were able to record and create um, some really amazing educational videos that will be released very, very soon. Um, so more to come on that, but we would invite each of you all listening in to um, watch those, share those again with your communities um, and be on the lookout for that. Um, and so just to kind of close this up before we open it up for any additional questions, two specific things or three specific things rather that each of you can do. And we invite you to do any or all of these. Um, so first, we do have a partnership program through the Newborn Screening Family Education Program. So if you, are, if you are an individual or a part of an organization that is listening in and says, I'd like to know more about what you're doing with this program, um, I'd like to learn more about your resources, I'd like to, to be involved, please, please, please contact me directly and I can provide more information on how to do that. I'll share my email in just a moment. Um, so the first thing is you can become a, become a program partner. Uh, and join us. Join us in sharing our resources with your network. Join us in collaborating if there are opportunities that you see for education. Join us in collaborating to reach out to other families. Um, we're definitely open to that. And the you know, a significant part of the successes that we've had as a program is through the partners that we've been able um, to collaborate and work with. Second thing each of you can do is share the opportunity about this program. If you are a family listening in, you have a newborn experience that you wanna share more and connect with others, reach out to us, learn more about how to become a part of this program. Or if you're um, joining from an advocacy organization or a, you're a provider and you have families that come to mind, please feel free to contact us and we'd be happy to reach out to anyone that you think might be interested in participating or learning more. And then last but not least, I'll share in just a moment another QR code that has a, that links to an entire toolkit of newborn screening resources that have all been designed with families um, as a part of that design process and that are available to be shared um, if that's something that you would like to do. So you can scan this QR code, feel free to share our toolkit. There are a variety of different tools in here, including social media resources. If you use social media and want to post more to raise awareness, there are educational videos, there are online curriculums that can be shared with families. There is a whole host of resources that are available. So please, please, please know that this is there and feel free um, to utilize it however you think would be most helpful. And then as I have mentioned many times already, we are actively recruiting for our next group of ambassadors. And I hope if we haven't already um, convinced you as to how impactful and helpful this program has. You know, please email me. I'd be happy to talk to you even more. And so would any of these ladies and any of the other ambassadors that we have. So if you are interested in joining or in learning more, please um, first email me. My email address is provided here. We can also drop that in the chat box. Um, the, the recruitment process, we ask that you complete an interest form, and we were trying to collect all of those by the end of this week, um, September 23rd. So I know it's not a quick turnaround time, but if you are interested, definitely email me. And then last, um, we have a few other steps to complete enrollment, and we're hoping to wrap all of that up by October 3rd. Um, so with that, again, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz, Lisa, and Tara for sharing. And um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and turn it over to the chat box and to you all. Please feel free if you're an audience listening in, if you want to unmute and you feel comfortable doing so, you are more than welcome to do that. Feel free to ask any questions that you might have. And if not, I'll, um, I'm happy to check the chat box. So I see one question here, um, if you guys don't mind elaborating, and thank you, Dion, for the question. What is one thing that you feel that needs the most attention in the newborn screening space? Is it awareness policy, more disorders, or diseases on the rest list? So maybe kind of what's your general, what do you think needs the most attention? It's hard to pick just one thing, but I would <laughs> definitely say the entire rest process needs to be it needs to be smoothed out. Um, there's so much of a burden put on advocacy groups. For instance, the CREB A nomination package that's all put together by advocacy groups and doctors, it was a thousand pages long. And it's this nine month process. They can only approve two conditions a year. 
something has to be done. And I know that all comes back to funding, but it's really, it's really frustrating knowing that children are literally dying because they can only add two conditions a year and then it can take 10 years for states to add the conditions. So I would say the rest. Yeah, I would say if I was asked that question at the start of the ambassador program, I'd say awareness based on my experience. Um, but hearing the, the, you know, the bigger picture of newborn screening, I would agree with Lisa, the rest. And of course I'm going to agree. And, um, but also just, you know, I, I can't remember which of you said it, but just families having a seat at the table. I'm sure we've all said it a million times, but just like on a, the advisory council and decision-making bodies, um, the family voice being present in the room always. Yeah, and please feel free to go ahead and jump in and ask, ask away. And I apologize if I didn't interpret your question correctly. No, you, <laughs> no, you, you are absolutely fine. Um, the reason that I asked this, I wholeheartedly, when I wanted to jump through the screen when Liz and kiss Liz, when she said um, that it should be required uniform um, screen panel. And the reason that I asked the question that I asked is because I had meetings with, let me start off with saying, I run a nonprofit organization called Rare and Black, and we raise the voices and experience of Black people living with rare diseases. But I am wholeheartedly for three years been really into newborn screening because um, Medicare, Medicaid pays $500,000 a year for me to stay alive every year. Um, and I'm convinced that um, the, the rare dis diseases that I acquired because I was chronically ill wouldn't have changed. But I was meeting with some Congress people this week <clears throat> um, and last week. And one of them, I was, of course, the ask is, can you j join the rare disease caucus? Um, and I was giving them a one sheet or one pager on the, 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 um, the caucus, but I also was trying to get them to reauthorize the newborn screening uh, reauthorization act, right? They based two Congress people basically said, well, it failed because of who was in Congress, but I'm like, but re people's children need this money and we need it to be. So when they asked me, well, what do you think is the most important thing? And I'm like, well, one doesn't trump the other, but if you really wanna know, I want all of the rare diseases to be on the rust list. I need, that needs to be changed. I don't know who needs to do that or who I need to talk to, but that's why I asked the question that I asked because I, I'm not an ambassador. I didn't go through the training. I'm just a patient with five rare diseases. And my 18 year old just got diagnosed with the rare disease that she's had all her life. I just feel stupid for not even recognizing it because I thought it was just, she was just flexible, not knowing that, you know, it, it causes, it can cause, it can be fatal. So when I, this point forward, I'll know when I'm asking for um, a congressperson for some uh, res resolution or changes within the newborn screening space, what I need to ask for. I think Dion sounds like she'd make an awesome ambassador. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I already put it in the chat, guys. I already put it in the Join chat. Join us on it. Join us on it. Yes. And I, 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 it's actually perfect timing. I did want to take a minute here at the very end to thank some other people who aren't a part of this panel, but that I know are listening in. And um, some of those are other ambassadors, but also Ms. Toyna Williams, who just spoke up, um, was really the co-facilitator of this ambassador program. And it would not have happened and would not have been a success um, without her incredible insight personal experiences and knowledge. So thank you to Tawana and to all of the other ambassadors um, who have helped shape and inform and educate as you've heard all of um, these stories today. So um, I wanna give, we have two minutes. Um, I don't wanna cut anybody off. So let me just double check that there aren't any other questions or again, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask. I think we got them all. Um, so thank you so much uh, for all of you who joined us today. Again, just to reiterate, if 
any of this is resonating with you and you would like more information about any of the opportunities that are available, this program or otherwise, please email me directly. We would be happy to connect with you and get you plugged in. Um, and we just thank you uh, for joining us. And thank you again to Liz, Lisa, and Tara um, for just sharing your incredible knowledge and experiences with us. Thank you all. Have a wonderful afternoon and join us again next time.